Hello, can you guys hear us? Yes. Uh, we can hear you. You can go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, um, welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, meetup. Um, the meetup is Cloud Scale Data Science Visual User Group. Uh, my name is Bertolt Reinhold, and I have with me um, Oscar de la de Lara Yelias, <laughs> but I let him introduce himself. Sure. Uh, so, I work on the Big Insights Analytics uh, team mainly working on large-scale analytic solutions. Uh, and I'm one of the main developers and contributors of Big R, which is one of the products we're going to showcase today uh, to enable R users to access, manipulate, and visualize big data from the R language using the uh, same R syntax. So thank you, uh, Romeo, for um hosting us. Uh, today's topic is uh, it's on advanced topics on massive Cloud data processing with R, Big R, and uh, System ML. Uh, it's going to be um, partly a presentation, and uh, we also want to show a demo so you get uh, a feel for how things are working. Um, we assume that the audience is a, a data scientist audience, uh, people who have uh, R or MATLAB or Vika or any kind of statistical, or Python, uh, for that matter, uh, experience. And uh, people who have been tasked recently or in the past several years with um, big data problems and uh, to do big data analytics on large data sets. So let's dive into the presentation. Uh, we have uh, just one high-level slide here. Uh, there's not much to say here. We just assume that everyone, to some degree, knows R. But uh, as you know, R has been around for two plus decades. Um, it is free. It's open source. Uh, and in the past, let's say, five years or so, um, the R community has seen an explosion in usage, uh, primarily driven by enterprises who want to perform data analytics. And we also observed a, a much stronger industry commitment by the enterprise data vendors as well as the big data companies. So a large of large enterprises, including IBM, HP, Oracle, Teradata, Microsoft, um, hook up the enterprise software with uh, our open source. R is extremely popular. CRAN is the official repository. There is uh, close to 5,000 packages available on CRAN now for all kinds of different aspects ranging from data exploration, uh, descriptive statistics and machine learning, all the way to visualization. However, R has been created 20 plus years ago uh, mostly by academia, and it was not created with big data in mind. So naturally, large data volumes uh, are a weakness uh, of R as it prefers to load all of its data into a memory and run in a single core, which is not feasible for large data volumes. It was not designed uh, with Hadoop parallel data processing in mind, and there's definitely a lack of scalable algorithms in terms of data volume, but also in terms of parallel compute. So we are going to talk about uh, a capability provided by IBM Big Insights Data Scientist, an R package called uh, IBM Big R, 
and we want to focus on the three key capabilities that uh, IBM Big R provides to more or less overcome the weaknesses that we pointed out on the previous slide. Point number one is we want to enable the R users to do you know, scalable data querying on big data. Number two, we want to enable the R users to run their native R functions, okay, some of those close to 5,000 packages in parallel on a Hadoop cluster. That way they are able to leverage existing R assets to do big data processing. Obviously, this approach will have limitations, and we will very clearly point out those limitations, and that will lead over to the third point that we want to talk about, which are scalable algorithms that go beyond the limitations that you will face running just R packages. We will point out a wide class of scalable algorithms. This list is growing. And point out some of the um, magic that will happen behind the scene in order to get uh, to scalable algorithms. Here is one architecture slide. It's very simple. Um, the data scientists are sitting at the very top into an, in, a, in an R instance. So you're sitting at the comfort of your R console, meaning you're running R command line, you're running Rattle, you're running R Studio, you're running R Shiny Server, whatever your preferred tool is, and you, lo you load the IBM Big R package into your instance. The IBM Big R package will give you capabilities to connect to your Hadoop cluster that runs uh, IBM Data Scientist on it. And this is where you have sitting all your large data in the Hadoop file system in different formats ranging from CSV files, Hive tables, HBase, and that list is growing as well. And then we will go through the different mechanisms that allow you to do scalable data querying on the cluster to stand up parallel R instances on the cluster to run native R functions and also run scalable algorithms that do not deploy R instances anymore but run in Hadoop meaning in MapReduce or in Scala, in a distribu distributed fashion, your data operations. So we will go through each one of those three bullets separately. Let's take a look at an, at an example uh, using R as a query language on big data. Um, you load the big R package, and the big R package gives you a data structure called a big R dot frame, which is modeled after the existing R data frame. And you can use a big R frame to point at your data set sitting in an HDFS file system. Here we point at the airline data set. Uh, we assume that all of you are familiar with the airline data set. It has about 128 million rows in it and 30 or 40 columns. The big R frame gives you a variable air, which is obviously not loading the entire data set into your, R, into your R instance, but the big R frame defines a promise object, which is a proxy pointing to the CSV file sitting in the distributed file system. Uh, but the air data frame is then a big R frame, is a, like a data frame, so you can perform more or less all the operations that they're used to performing on a data frame, meaning you can apply some predicates on it and some grouping functions, such as the first one, how many flights were flown by United or Delta. So you access the unique carrier column in the air big frame and look at the values United Airlines, and you only want to include United Airlines and Delta Airlines, and then you count the result in order to get uh, to the number of flights flown by those two airline carriers. 
The next query is very similar. You have a different predicate that says flights that were delayed by 15 plus minutes at departure or arrival. You apply this predicate, and then you're not interested in getting all the 30 or 40 columns back, but you only want to project out the five columns, which are unique carrier, origin, destination, departure delay, and arrival delay. You use that data set to define an air subset big R frame. This air subset big R frame, uh, you can further do processing on it in terms of uh, exploring some key statistics on that data frame, meaning you want to per unique carrier find out the uh, you know, how many, uh, what is the count of flights in there, what is the mean distance that has been flown, the mean elapsed time, and so forth on this air subset. So we have another function called summary that uh, provides you with that capability. We also have a big R histogram that allows you to uh, visualize um, uh, the results. Obviously, this presentation here is not a tutorial on Big R, yet we want to give you some feel for the functionality that is all provided uh, by the Big R package. Uh, we just have a very high-level summary of all the functions that Big R provides in this one table here. Obviously, it gives you some uh, functions to connect to your uh, Hadoop cluster through connect and disconnect, providing some credentials. We have a limited number of HDFS functions wrapped and um, made available in our package, by, such as list file system, remove files, and things like that. And then we have types and functions exposed by Big R, and the most important type, obviously, is the Big R frame, but we also have vector, list, and matrix, which we will come back to shortly. Then we have functions on those types, uh, people are interested in the dimensions, meaning the number of rows and the number of columns. You can look at the columns names, set the column types. You can look at the head and tail of your big R frame. Uh, and we have also coercion and casting functions there that allow you to take an existing R data frame, such as your favorite um, IRIS data set, cast it into a big R frame uh, to ship it to your cluster and persist it there and do some uh, operations on the cluster on it and things like that. We also have arithmetic operations, mathematical string operations, aggregate functions, and statistical functions. The miscellaneous ones we're going to skip as well as the visualization because you will see that in the demo. Um, but we definitely want to talk about bullets two and three, uh, which takes us to the, you know, how can you run R functions on the cluster? And if you have some database background, then this concept is very similar to, uh, as opposed to running your um, uh, SQL logic in your application, you actually want to wrap it as in the form of store procedures or user-defined functions and push them closer to the data. Okay? So this is what applying our functions does, and we will talk about it next. And afterwards, we will talk about the scalable algorithms. So on this next slide here, uh, this is a very cool example here. I, every single time we, we talk about it, I, I get very excited about it. Uh, you have 128 million uh, big R frame, and um, you as a data scientist have been tasked with uh, creating, um, let's say, regression trees uh, per unique carrier that is found in that data set. So here we define of the air data frame another big frame, BF, uh, where we just include two airlines, Hawaiian Airlines and United Airlines. And big R frame, big R package then provides you with a function called group apply. Okay? The group apply takes in three parameters, as you see on this slide. Uh, one of them is the big R frame pointing to the data set, and then an attribute called grouping columns that allows you to specify a list of columns in your big R frame that you want to group on, okay? And 
uh, the unique carry in our BF frame only has two distinct values in it, Hawaiian Airlines and United Airlines. So the task is per for Hawaiian Airlines as well as for United Airlines, you want to create a decision tree. How do you want to create a decision tree? Well, you want to use one of those 5,000 packages that you find on CRAN, and we found one called R-Part, which is a recursive partitioning and regression tree, which is fairly popular to create regression trees. So in the R function that we define in the third attribute here, we receive as an input a data frame. And that is not a big R frame, it's a real data frame, okay? So all of the data per group needs to fit into this data frame. And then we define and implement a function in here, and it's a, only a three-liner. First, we load the R part package, okay? Then we define a, a list of uh, predictive columns, which are arrival delay, departure delay, departure time, and distance. And then we take the DF data frame project out the predictive columns that we are interested in and feed that one into the R part function, okay? Together with the formula that says, on all the columns in this data frame, create me a regression tree to predict uh, the arrival delay. This R part function will return a regression tree, okay, which we then return to the invoking environment. Now, group apply in this example because we have only two distinct uh, unique carriers, Hawaiian Airline and United Airline, it will return a, a list of decision trees that is captured in the model's variable, okay? And in the last line, you see that we can take the model's variable, and we have another function there called bigr.pull, which allows you to, uh, to, and models is a big R um, vector, a list, of, it's a big R list, okay? Meaning all the data resides on the cluster, and the big R dot pull allows you to pull this list from the Hadoop cluster onto your client uh, R instance. And then you have your R model sitting there. So this is a very cool technology it allows you to push compute, large compute, onto the Hadoop cluster as long as your data problem is partitionable. Okay? Problem now is, what happens if my group data or the data within one group does not fit into a single R instance? Okay? Obviously, it then happens whatever happens with R, meaning it runs out of memory and it falls flat on its nose. Okay? And this is where the scalable algorithms come into the picture. On this example here, you don't see uh, the decision tree, but we switched the example to a big R linear regression, which is the very last line here. Big R dot L M invokes not the R linear regression, but invokes a scalable algorithm that implements linear regression without having any R instances involved at all, besides the fact that you're invoking this algorithm for, from an R instance. Okay? The big R.LM interface is modeled after the existing R.LM interface. So you take in a data frame, in this case a big R data frame, and you provide a formula uh, to do the linear regression on, and then you, it returns <coughs> a linear regression model. Okay, so it's very simple, and hopefully now the question in your head is, you know, what is all the other stuff that you have to do before being able to invoke big R to the LM? Well, this is where you really should start to appreciate all the work that R does under the covers for you, meaning it's able to load in a data frame with uh, string and numeric values. 
into <coughs> memory, and it actually performs a lot of uh, data transformations under the covers, namely being the factorization of, of, of values into numeric values, doing, you know, null value treatment, binning, and so forth in order to invoke uh, an algorithm. Now, when we designed Big R, we were thinking of doing a similar things, hiding all this complexity in those functions. But our design point is large data, okay? And all those transformations performing on large data is a lot of work, okay? So easily doing all this work under the covers transparently would not be a good idea. Hence, we decided to make it explicit, so we introduced another function there called big R transform that takes in the airline data set, a big R frame, and then you can specify recoding of attributes, meaning uh, you know, string values turning into numeric values, missing value uh, treatment, okay, as well as uh, imputation. Here you see a global mean method to do missing value imputation. Binning of attributes, specifying the number of bins, specifying the, the bin methods, such as equibit in this case, as well as maybe not that important for linear regression, but for logistic regression, it would be very important to do dummy coding on uh, some of the categorical values. Okay, so you can always specify which columns in your big R frames to dummy code. Big R.LM is one of the examples uh, but obviously we have uh, a larger, and before we get to the larger list, in terms of user experience, uh, on the next slide here you see a screenshot. You know, we uh, use RStudio quite a bit. It's exactly the same code as you've seen on the previous slide, but at the bottom you would see like the, the head or the tail of your airline data frame. On the right-hand panel you would be able to, to look at your big R documentation on linear regression and so forth. Exactly the same code. We have a, a long list of scalable algorithms. This list is significantly growing, um, trying to cover all the different categories in you know, statistical processing as well as machine learning. So we have um, scalable algorithms for descriptive statistics, doing univariate, bivariate, stratified bivariate uh, uh, computations. We have various classification algorithms Multinomial logistic regression, multi-class SVM, multinomial naive base clustering. We have k-means regression. We have uh, linear regression with different variations, as well as uh, GLM with a variety of distributions and link functions. For all those models, we have the corresponding uh, scoring scripts, and we have our you know, Swiss Army knife transformation functions that allows you to do recoding of values, dummy coding, binning, scaling, as well as uh, missing value imputation. So I hope everyone is very excited now. And so I'm going to hand it over to Oscar, who will uh, you know, move away from the slide we're here and, and show a real demo on some of the similar examples as you've just seen on, 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 the, on the slide. And then we will come back and you know, open up the hood a little bit and take a look. Uh, you know, what is really the engine that makes the scalable algorithms work? Oscar. Right. Thanks a lot, Red Bull, for your wonderful presentation. So let's have some uh, fun here, uh, trying to see things in action. So in this example, that I'm going to demo. Um, we're going to build a support vector machine classifier to try to predict the arrival delay of the flight. We're going to use the same uh, airline data set. In this example, of course, just for the sake of the demo, we're going to use a much smaller sample, uh, I believe a 0.1% sample, uh, which has around 120,000 um, rows. So this is the RStudio client, which um, is uh, one of the most popular R editors. So in here, I'm going to show you the just excuse me for one sec. Let me just close this thing. Don't reboot. <laughs> I will not. <laughs> Pardon me. Very nice. It's really hard to actually to kill. You have to go through the process. Anyways, 
So first thing you need to do in order to start using Big R is to load the library or the package. Just the same way you load any other R package, you type library Big R. And then you need to establish a connection to the cluster. This, this is a JDBC connection to the uh, begin size cluster. So we are just specifying here a host name and then some credentials. Uh, and then we are connected. So you, we can check it here is Big R connected, and boom, we're online. Um, so the first thing we need to do now after we have connected to the cluster is to load, and I would say load in a very not literal way because we are not loading the entire data set back to the client, but just instantiating a new uh, proxy to the data set. So in this case, we specify uh, using this uh, big R that frame um, method, we are creating a new big R that frame, which again is similar to a data that frame, but scales up to arbitrary large data sets. We specify the data path, and uh, this data path is on HDFS. It's not local system. It's a HDFS file in CSV format. We specify uh, that the type of the data is a delimited file. By default, comma is the the default separator, the default delimiter, oh, but we specify it here as well. Um, we are saying also that we have headers in the file, so headers equal through. The first line is then going to be automatically picked up as the column names of the data set. And here we just do a little R trick to specify the column types. In this case, we are saying that for uh, the columns number 9, 11, 17, 18, and 23, they are going to be character, and the remaining ones are going to be treated as integer, right? And finally, we specify here use map reduce equals false. So we do have a um, local processing optimization to uh, speed things up, especially when you're working with smaller data sets. Uh, we all are aware of the fact that spawning MapReduce jobs is, is certainly expensive and it's not meant for interactive applications. So if the data is small enough, we don't need to spawn MapReduce jobs, but rather we just work on in one single node local mode optimization. Um, and then if you want to scale and use the same uh, procedure to work with larger data sets, you just uh, bypass this parameter, or you just put through as opposed to false. But the syntax and the primitives are exactly the same. And that's the reason why we get this warning message that this type of uh, execution mode is only suitable for small data. So you are not supposed to load larger data sets using uh, having this use map reduce false. Okay? So we have our air data set. So if we type something like structure of air, right? This is going to be very similar to what you would have using a data that frame. For those of you that maybe are not that familiar with that data that frame concept, uh, I can illustrate it here real quick. So we have IRIS, which is one of the data sets that come with R. And again, this is not big R anymore. This is just plain, pure R, vanilla R. And if you type the structure function, you will get that this uh, object, IRIS, is a data that frame, which is uh, 150 observations, five variables. Here are your columns. Here is a snapshot of your data. So we mimic, we replicate the exact same behavior to make big R really useful. So if you are a big R, uh, sorry, an R user, you don't have to learn a new paradigm. You don't have to write MapReduce jobs. You don't have to, you know, go beyond your R environment. Everything is self-contained in R and using the same primitives and uh, syntax. Okay. So um, now we have a bunch of columns here that may not be useful for prediction. So I just um, decided that let's project out some relevant columns. So in this case, I'm just saying uh, let's create a new big order frame called airline filtered, right, which takes air, which is the uh, entire data set, and let's just project this particular one, two, three, four, five, six columns, right? After I executed this, nothing's been materialized, no new file is being created, 
but just uh, an, another proxy to this particular query is being created, right? So you, you don't need to move data around every time you perform a big R operation. Now if we take a look at the structure of airline filters, this one has less columns, right? The ones that we decided to project. Now, uh, I mentioned at the very beginning of the demo that we are going to do a support vector machine classifier, which means that we need a discrete variable to predict. So in this case, and again, I apologize for this. Um, so we are going to create, because in, in the original data set, the arrival delay, which is the variable we want to predict, it's uh, discrete, sorry, it's continuous, it's a real number. Um, so we want to discretize it. So we're going to create three different ranges. So everything that is above 15 minutes is going to be treated as delayed, right? Uh, everything which is below zero is going to be treated as early, and Anything else in between is going to be on time, right? So, and, um, okay, that's done. And again, I just wanted to point out that this if-else function, even though it looks exactly like R's, it's, it's big R's. So it can scale to arbitrary large data sets. And the same thing with this uh, subsetting operator, this bracket operator. It's exactly the same as R's, but it can scale to arbitrary large data sets. And then let's just create a bar plot, right, of uh, the um, delay, which is the new column that we added as the discrete version of the arrival delay. So uh, we are seeing that most of the flights in this case were early. Then we have some on-time flights here, and then a few of them were delayed, right? And that makes sense. So now we don't need the continuous version of the arrival delay anymore we're going to remove it, right? So I just say arrival delay, assign no, and again, this dollar operator is the same story, right? Was overloaded by big R, and it can scale to arbitrary large data sets, even though it looks exactly like ours. Now, my data set, let's take a look at how it's, it's looking now. Now I have the delay, which is on time early or uh, delayed, right? This new um, categorical column I created. Now I can also uh, find out which columns have missing values in order to apply the missing value imputation mechanisms that we offer. So by method, by executing method big R that which NA calls, I'm getting here that the column called distance has some missing values or some null values. So I may want to apply some null value imputation to you know, reduce the, the noise of, of the classification. So now let's just um, do all the transformations required to go ahead and create the classifier. So you can notice that this column delay is alphanumeric. It has alphanumeric values. Since in the machine learning world we work with matrices, we need them to be mapped to uh, numeric values. Right? So in this particular case, uh, we are going to use the big data transform precisely to recode this delay uh, column into uh, consecutive integers. And then on top of that, we can perform several um, other operations just to showcase all the capabilities that you have in the big data transform function. For instance, we have the day of the week, and uh, we can dummy code that particular attribute, meaning that uh, instead of having one single column for the day of the week, we're going to have seven different binary columns for uh, each of the days, right? Zero if, if, um, if your value belongs to that particular uh, day of the week, and, or sorry, one if, if, if your value is, is that particular day of the week and, and zero otherwise, and so forth. Uh, we're specifying here that we also want to recode the day of the week. Uh, some missing attributes that we want to do missing value imputation on, in this case, is distance, which is the one that was output by the previous function. 
And finally, we we'll specify where the data are going to be stored. In this case, we can also specify the uh, data format of the output file. In this case, we, we can have CSV as well. And uh, we can execute that particular function, um, which is going to uh, create a new copy of the data um, after all these transformations are performed. In that way, uh, you only pay the cost of the transformations once, and then once you have the uh, transformed data set, you can go ahead and you know, uh, execute as many algorithms as you want. Right? Now let's take a look at uh, how this data set is, is looking like. So in this case, we have a little more columns now because we dummy coded the day of the week column. Now we have seven different binary columns. Um, and then all the transformations are already performed there. Now let's do some more interesting things. For instance, let's um, uh, compute some univariate statistics of some of these columns, right? So we can use the summary function. And uh, by the way, this airline matrix is not a big R frame anymore. It's a big R that matrix object, right? And um, here I'm just saying let's compute some univariate statistics on these particular columns, right? And here, depending on the data types, we get different types of statistics. For example, for numeric columns, we get uh, minimum, maximum range, mean variance, standard deviation, standard error in mean, coefficient of variation, skewness and kurtosis, standard error in skewness and kurtosis, median, interquartile mean, interquartile mean um, for the numeric ones, and then for the categorical ones. In this case, we have only one categorical variable, which is the delay. Uh, for that particular one, you know, most of these uh, statistics don't make sense. So we only compute the number of categories. In this case, we have three of them, which is some, um, you know, early, delayed, or on time. The mode is early, as we can see in this plot. And the number of modes is one. In the case that you have more than one value, which have the highest frequency, then you have as many modes as, as, as values with the highest frequency. Okay? We can also do some other more interesting stats, such as uh, by various stats to try to find correlations between the predictors and the variable you want to predict. In this case, we are uh, saying let's find the pairwise uh, bivariate statistics between these three predictors and the delay, which is the variable you want to predict. And in this case, uh, we have computed an uh, F-test um, with some p-value there, and then um, also we computed the eta statistic, which which is useful to to determine whether there there is significant correlation between uh, pairs of attributes. Now, um, after doing some descriptive stats and after kind of understanding your data, let's try to do some modeling, right? So um, we have something called Big R that sample, which allows us to uh, do partition sampling, which is very useful for machine learning. In this case, we are uh, specifying two different percentages, 0.7 and 0.3, and we are going to use 70% of the data for training, 30% for testing, right? And again, this Big R that sample can scale to arbitrarily large data set, you could, you could have uh, terabytes of data and you can you know, create your training and testing uh, samples. Let's just double check that the samples came out right. So in this case, let's just find the proportion or the percentage uh, of uh, you know, rows compared to the total number of rows. In this case, we can see that roughly we have a 70-30 percent partition. So we're good to go, and then now we can go ahead and create a support vector machine model to predict the um, arrival delay. So in this um, implementation, we have the big R that SVM, which is similar to the SVM regular vanilla R, 
and we take as the input parameters um, a formula which specifies on the left side of the formula which is going to be the predictor, the, the variable to be predicted or the response variable. We're going to predict the delay grouping um, in based upon or using as predictors um, everything else, which is this dot wildcard. The data set that we're going to use is the train, which I just sampled in the previous step, right? Um, in this case, we don't have a binary class problem, so we have three different classes, so binary class is false, and this is the directory where it is going to be stored, uh, the model itself, right? It's, it's done, and now we have uh, the coefficients, right? So in this case, um, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 uh, variables. So that means that we have an 11-dimensional space. And we'll have in this example, since we have three classes, we'll have three different uh, hyperplanes in 11 dimensions, which are uh, precisely the uh, support vectors. Um, then once we have this model, we can test it or score it on the testing set. And we can actually compute some confusion matrix and some um, accuracy to actually evaluate how good the predictions were, right? So let's do that using the predict method, which is, again, the same method that you would use for any model in R, right? And then we are passing here the model we want to score, which is the one that we just created, the data set that we want to test or, or score the model on, which is the testing set that we just sampled in the previous step as well, and the uh, path where the scores are going to be stored, right? So after this is done, we can just uh, see what's in the predictions, and boom, we have um, the accuracy is 47%, which is uh, pretty bad, uh, meaning that perhaps uh, these features are not the right ones to perform these this, this predictions, or uh, perhaps this poor vector machine is not the best classifier for this problem. This is the confusion matrix. Uh, looks like uh, all of the flights were classified as early, which is pretty bad. But again, this is not a matter of, of whether the model is good or bad. It's just a matter of showcasing the capabilities of uh, big R to tackle this kind of uh, big data machine learning problems. And finally, we uh, output the scores, right? Delayed, early, or on time. And then with the scores, you can uh, use your favorite uh, you know, prediction method to come up with the actual predictions. If you want, for example, just get the maximum, right? And then compute the prediction uh, with the maximum score, you, you can easily go ahead and do that. Um, and with that, I conclude the uh, demo. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and I'll uh, give you <coughs> for talk back to continue with some other details on the uh, internals of, of the product. Okay, thank you for talk. Right. Thank you very much, Oscar, for this nice demo. I think that is uh, very exciting to see uh, some of those um, machine learning algorithms you know, not running in memory in your other instance, but uh, being able to scale it out uh, to, you know, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, depending on your cluster sizes. Okay. And I hope everyone is very excited now and is really wondering. Uh, how is IBM doing that, okay? And we just want to spend a couple of minutes to give you some feel for what's going on under the hood to provide those scalable algorithms and also how data scientists in your company could actually implement their own scalable algorithms. So 
on the right hand side of this slide here, you see actually the implementation of one version of BigArt.LM. Obviously, there is many different ways of doing linear regression models. In this example here, we chose it because it's a very compact and uh, easy to understand implementation. It uses a, a system of equations and then a direct solve method to uh, come up with a with a the betas to uh, define the linear regression model. In Big R, we defined uh, a language which has an R-like syntax for your data scientist to implement your own algorithms. And on the right-hand side, you can actually read exactly through, and if you're familiar with R, you can identify the different operations very easily, such as on line 15 here, you get the data set X in, you transpose it and do a matrix multiply with X. You do some uh, some scaling using a diag uh, of the lambda uh, operation as well as for transpose X on, on the label vector Y to get uh, to B and then you feed it into a solve function. Okay, This is uh, our language to implement scalable algorithms. Uh, it is a declarative high-level language um, that shields your data scientist from having to drop down to MapReduce Java code to implement uh, linear algebra operations, which would be a total waste of the time. This declarative high-level language will build a compiler with cost-based uh, optimization techniques that creates parallel execution plans based on data characteristics as well as cluster characteristics. Data characteristics means if you have small data sets, then we choose one execution plan, which might just be an in-memory single node implementation. But if you have very large data sets, then we might actually resort to uh, distributed runtime operators to do large matrix or linear algebra operations. So that way we really, sh with this language, we shield your algorithm developer from low level system implementations get them productive very quickly, and they don't have to worry about parallelization strategies, about scalability, numeric stability, or any kind of other systems optimizations. So in the interest of time, uh, we're going to skip this performance slide here, but we just want to give you a quick feel for the different execution plans. So on the right hand side on this slide you will you see exactly the same linear algebra uh, linear regression implementation please pay attention to lines 16 17 and 19 and let's assume you have a data set 4 terabytes with a label vector of 9 gigabytes and you want to run this data set on it well our <coughs> uh, compiler uh, understands the data characteristics of x and y it knows what operations to run on it's a large data set, so we run it in a MapReduce job, and we have uh, about six to seven different methods to do matrix multiplication in our system based on this specific implementation of saying TX matrix multiply with X itself. We have a dedicated matrix multiplication operation that can run on the map site only. So map site is excellent because it's highly parallel and um, has little data sh shuffle necessary, uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, good strategy to do that kind of operation. For the line 17, transpose x times y, our optimizer is smart enough to see, well, as opposed to transposing a large data set x, we actually do a, a transpose of y and matrix multiply it with x, and then we transpose the result of it, which is a small data set only. Um, y vector is a label vector uh, because of the cluster configuration of uh, 3.5 gigabytes. We understand that Y actually fits into the JVMs of uh, your MapReduce job. Hence, we take Y and put it into the distributed cache, make it available to all the mappers, and with the same scan of X, we can do uh, line 17 implementation to do uh, a Y times X. Okay. The result of it gets uh, shuffled to the reducer. It's, it's very small. It's all map site computation. Uh, you only need one reducer. And the result of it 
transpose x times x is a small matrix, transpose x times y is, is, a, is a short vector. Uh, there is no need for subsequently to do any map reduce jobs because it can just be done in memory. Now, your question in the mind should be, well, that is all beautiful. Those guys just went ahead and implemented this beautiful map reduce job, and life is good. Well, it's extremely flexible, and we want to show you a couple of more execution plans. What would happen if you have more rows or more columns, less columns or less rows, or your cluster configuration changes? Well, the same script on the left-hand side, the same algorithm is still there, but so far for the example that you've seen on the previous slide, we get away with a, a single map reduced job and then a single in-memory operation. Now, if you uh, triple the number of columns, okay, our optimization to do the TXX implementation does not apply anymore because not the entire row fits, is available to all the mappers. Hence, we resort to a different matrix multiplication method in our system, and that one requires two map reduced jobs, uh, and this, the original TXY still runs in the single map reduced job. So for this data configuration, you would have three map reduced jobs. If it doubles the number of rows instead of 300 million, you have 600 million rows. Well, uh, the same uh, TXX can still be executed, but the, but the TXY, we, again, we have to resort to a different way of doing matrix multiplication. You would have three map reduced jobs. If you have a smaller X and a smaller Y correspondingly, actually there is no need to kick off any map reduced job at all. You can just do a single node to our computation. Or if your cluster configuration changes because uh, you have a multi-tenant environment and other people want to run different configurations, well, our compiler would automatically adjust and create a, a corresponding map reduced job for it. The takeaway of this one scenario here is really the left hand side, your map your your algorithm implementation stays as it is, but leave it up to uh, system to our big R compiler to create the optimal parallel execution plan depending on your data characteristics and systems characteristics. So let us briefly summarize and then we're gonna open up for questions. Uh, Longer term, into the future, IBM is committed to provide a, a machine learning platform. Uh, here we focused a lot on learning algorithms and make them scalable in our r -like syntax, but we also want to include much more in terms of data pre-processing, feature engineering, as well as other machine learning constructs. I hope you got some good feeling here about our differentiator, which is really this cost-based compilation of the machine learning algorithm that runs for single node in-memory operations, distributed cluster operations, and we really do hybrid execution plans. Even for a given algorithm, some of the operations run in-memory, other operations will have distributed operators. It works for varying data characteristics with you know, hundreds or billions of rows, tens or tens of millions of columns, dense and sparse data, um, because large data very often is uh, sparse data. We have a list of out-of-the-box scalable machine learning algorithms ranging from descriptive statistics to regression clustering and classification. But ultimately, your data scientists really should be able to implement uh, their own uh, machine learning algorithms to do their own custom analytics. Uh, and our language will give them a fast turnaround time to specify the algorithms, iterate over and optimize their algorithms to get their results. We also and did not have time today to talk about it. We have uh, a lot of work uh, going on in terms of beefing up our language to include ensemble learning and cross-validation to have more machine learning specific uh, language constructs that actually go beyond to the capability that you find today in R. Okay. And uh, hopefully it's also clear that implementing your algorithm in this higher level language will kind of preserve your investment in developing those algorithms and newer technologies. Just to tell you a story, we started with this work about five plus years ago. We were in Hadoop 1, now we are in Hadoop 2.6. A lot of things changed, but your algorithm implementation should not have changed at all. However, the compiler and the system implementation obviously evolved. 
we are yarn enabled, we do research negotiation, we grow uh, with the clusters, we have elasticity there. Uh, MapReduce is not the only game in town anymore. We also uh, will have a Spark for in-memory iterative processing to speed up our algorithms. Uh, we will include machine learning specific data transformations and we are definitely committed to the R ecosystem uh, by um, having our R package there and make it usable to the entire R community. Sorry for the rush at the end here a little bit. Uh, thank you very much for attending this webcast and uh, we can, Romeo, we can open up for uh, questions. Great. Thanks, Bertolt and Oscar. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are questions, you can unmute your line by pressing star six and just go ahead. If you face any problems, you can also type your question into the chat box and I will just read it. And Romeo, if there is no questions now, uh, you know, feel free to pass on our email addresses and we will always be happy to respond to any questions by email offline. Okay, so there's one question. Uh, about the performance chart, maybe can you just go back to that performance chart, please? Okay. So, Bastian, so please feel free to ask, uh, press star six to unmute, and you can just ask if you like. Uh, if, if there is no specific question, uh, this one chart here actually just shows um, running. Um, our linear regression implementation through R, okay? And at the bottom, we just vary the, the number of rows. We have a, a data frame with 1,000 columns, and we range the number of rows from 1,000 all the way up to 100 million. Uh, the execution time is at log scale, so you see a nice straight line for R performance, and it's R3.1. Uh, for small data problems, it doesn't really matter, but R goes nicely up to, let's say, eight gigabytes with a million rows, and you see some performance there. This is single node R, single threaded, while the green line is uh, our IBM uh, you know, system ML implementation of linear big R dot LM. And you see that for small data problems, we are actually, you know, like uh, for 10,000 or 100,000 rows, we are actually faster than R. Uh, we still run in a single node, Okay, but uh, everyone knows that um, our linear algebra operations are not always the fastest, and we have our own matrix multiplication library implemented, and it's uh, quite optimized, and it's a very efficient implementation. So that goes up to 100,000 rows, and then you see almost a, a horizontal line here going up to a million rows. What happens here is actually our system ML compiler, given the data size, it actually decides to compile a parallel execution plan, Okay, and for a million uh, rows, we are actually uh, a factor of 28 times faster than R. Okay, if you continue growing the number of rows, R runs out of memory. Uh, our implementation happily executes uh, and goes up to 800 gigabytes, which is about uh, 100 million rows. That's an important data point because uh, we have uh, six nodes in this cluster. Uh, and 800 gigabytes is larger than the distributed aggregated memory. So we run an, an out-of-core implementation. Okay, thanks a lot. It's actually quite impressive. Thank you. So there's another question in the chat box. Um, so he's interested in hearing your thoughts about developing model which seems to require a computing plane and a data plane. Uh, not everything can be done in memory and not everything should be necessarily map reduced. Can you maybe comment on that, please? Sure. I mean, uh, I mean, there's a data plane, there's a compute plane, and then we are sitting actually on top of a compute plane. So the data plane is, uh, you know, your Hadoop file system, okay, or whatever data store 
you prefer to have there and we can access. Okay, and there's obviously it's a question about the data formats. In terms of compute planes, uh, we essentially have, uh, we can choose between three, okay, at some point. We have our single node multi threaded implementation, that is all our own framework. Then, uh, if that one runs out of steam, okay, then we can either resort to a, a map reduce plane or to a spark plane, okay? Uh, and in that case, we would just uh, you know, exploit the map user API or exploit the, the, the Spark API in order to do distributed operations. But uh, we would just, you know, set up our jobs, okay, or set up our stages in, in, in Spark Lingo, and that one would just uh, incorporate our char files, our runtime to do the, the, the block, stru block structure matrix operations. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Oscar and Bertolt, and also for the audience for joining. And uh, I will discuss later if we can share a recording, and if so, I will post it to the meetup group. And I wish everybody a nice evening in Europe and a nice um, lunch in New York and a uh, nice morning in Pacific time. Thank you, everybody. Merci. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>